impact upon world events and what this cabal can do and can't do. Because, like I said, that, that's the whole point of what I do. Um, when people say to me, um, well, you wrote this in 1990-odd and look, it's happening, that doesn't give me, funnily enough, any satisfaction. The whole point is not to be uh, proved right about um, things happening. It's to alert enough people to, to, to create an intervention that stops it happening. That's the whole point. And uh, if people now will move from observing what's going on and reading and, 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 and concluding what's going on from that to actually intervening in it through ways I'll talk about in the on the world tour then we can stop this happening we must move from knowing nothing about what's going on to observing in some knowledge to see what's going on, to actually impacting upon what's going on, so it stops going on. And so I'm doing these events all over the world, and they're all day events. They're from 10 o'clock in the morning I start talking, and I'll finish at 10 o'clock at night. There are breaks, of course. Um, but the reason I talk for so long, and there's about... 1600 images and other illustrations um, is because I am connecting dots across a vast range of apparently unconnected subjects and happenings to show that actually it's all connected and can be um, put together very simply step by step by step to put what is happening into, and this is the word, context. We, we must have context for events, happenings. Otherwise, we cannot possibly understand them in terms of their true reason for happening and what they're there to achieve. So I've spent months um, putting this uh, presentation together uh, and, and getting the images right, getting the order right. And um, I ad lib the actual words because after 26 years, you know, you've downloaded so much information that you can do that. But the images are um, crucial to add to the words and also the order keeps me on the right step by step A to B to C to D um, unfolding story so it's easiest to um, to see and follow uh, for people who may be coming across it for the first time I hope they are because that's the point to get more and more people in front of this information um, who've not seen it before and I know from my experience over the years that when you do that, people are never the same again in terms of the way they see themselves and their own power to um, impact upon their own lives in the world. And never the same again in terms of the way they watch the television news or read the newspapers or hear what politicians are saying, because suddenly they can see what they're really saying and what they're really writing and why, as opposed to what it appeared to be in isolation before. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this uh, tour more than any I've ever done and um, I uh, hope, trust that by the time we get into 2017 there's going to be a great um, a greatly increased number of people who are seeing the world in a different way and having it enhance their lives because of that. And it will be interesting to see how many come around the world because that's a kind of barometer on, in a way, on where people are. Like my whole, you know, 
life in the last 26 years has been a barometer from no interest at all to, to, to massive interest, that shows that humanity is waking up uh, from the program, from the, the coma. Just as I, told it, I was told it would happen. Uh, but we've got to kick on from here. Because really, we've only just started. And uh, there's a lot more work to do. And I tell you what, I'm at the front of the queue. Because after, after seeing where it was to seeing where it is, uh, we are making progress and we are making a difference. And um, to those who are behind this global manipulation, you ain't seen nothing yet. Education. Oh, it's a boring education. Actually, what's happening to our children and to young people in what's called the education system is so vital for people, not least parents, to appreciate because of the goal that it has and indeed has, to a large extent, achieved of programming and conditioning the minds of young people and children so they become the adults that suit the system in future generations of people in the workplace. What's kind of prompted me to do this subject this week is the announcement by the British government, but it's something you find all around the world, this theme, including the United States. The stated intention of the British government to extend the school day. Just look at it, step by step by step, the totalitarian tiptoe, as I call it, and you'll see how more and more of a child's time is controlled by the state and how parental power and influence is being eroded at the same speed. We are seeing the minds of children hijacked by the state in multiple ways that I'll be describing. And these plans, which also include a, a guy from this um, British education government watchdog called Ofsted, calling for children to go to school at two I mean, we're on the road to, to, to children coming out of the womb and, and, and going straight into the class. Oh, we've got one coming out now. Here you go, here you go, here you go. Gotcha. Okay, class 1A, algebra. Tell him what X equals. Madness. And we're only where we are now. We are not where this is planned to go and you can't divorce what's happening in so-called education in terms of uh, control uh, of, of children by the state and the way the state's social services around the world are taking on a more and more industrial scale children from loving parents for the most spurious, outrageous reasons that make them up and handing them to control of the state. These things are all connected because what we're looking at is the end of parenthood, which is what Aldous Huxley was talking about. In Brave New World, published back in the 1930s, 
but not as the novel it's said to be, but more the blueprint from insider knowledge of where it was meant to go. And that is where we're going now, quicker and quicker. Now, um, I quote in my new book, Phantom Self, uh, on a, a kind of range of subjects, a Rockefeller family insider um, who was speaking in 1969 to a group of doctors, and one of them um, explained later what he'd said that night. And what he said was how the world was going to change, because it's all planned to change that way. And it is in extraordinary detail, the world we see now, and the world that's coming so fast, unless we part the arse from the sofa. And what he said, he said a number of things about education, and among them was that children would spend more time in school, yeah, but they wouldn't learn anything. And what he meant was they wouldn't learn anything that they needed to know. They would simply, in my words, download their perceptions from the state to suit the state. He talked about education being used to control who had access to information and that schools would become what he called the hub of the community. And that means in truth, that schools would become, certainly in the first stage of this sequence, the new parents. And look at how uh, more and more uh, dictatorial powers um, expressed by dictatorial people, often called head teachers, etc., that are being um, used by the state to dictate to parents and dictate to children. And more and more, not even dictate to them only through the school day, but, but what they do afterwards. I'll get into that um, later on. And this programming, because what schools are, are programming prisons. And the idea is to use it as a sausage machine conveyor belt to take children from the earliest age and program their perceptions for life, perceptions that suit the state and the need and desire for mass control. And that means destroying spontaneity, destroying free thought, destroying um, the ability to look at a situation and see how dots connect. And like I say, it's working. Uh, this is a study by the uh, Professor of Education at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. And it involves school aged children between uh, kindergarten and uh, through to 12th grade. And this is what they found happened in the period in between. A massive decline of creativity as, quote, children became less emotionally expressive, less energetic, less talkative and verbally expressive, less humorous, led, less imaginative, um, less unconventional. All the words that the state requires uh, minds to be if it's going to control people en masse. Less lively and passionate, less perceptive, less apt to connect seemingly irrelevant things, connecting dots so you see the picture. Uh, less synthesizing and less likely to see things from a different angle. Precisely. To see things in a barely one-dimensional way, that this is how it is and there's no other possibilities. Because that's what the state wants. 
schools are programming prisons for children. And you know, when uh, you know parents say, "Oh, they care for their kids and they love their kids," and I'm sure I'm sure they do in that way. But if parents want the best for their children and they want their children to express their true uniqueness and true potential for creativity and express the gifts that they have, which may not often involve passing ludicrous exams, then they need to get involved in what's going on. They need to see what's going on. They need to think what's happening when I drop my child off at school until I pick them up again. What's going on in there? How, uh, how, is, my, how is my child being educated as against simply programmed with the state's version of everything? So uh, if we look um, at the definitions of programming and prison. Programming um, is one, to insert or encode specific operating instructions into a machine or apparatus. They want children to be turned into machines is the whole point of it. To insert instructions into a machine or apparatus. To cause to absorb or incorporate automatic responses, attitudes or the like to condition. My goodness me, is that education uh, uh, in one sentence? Or what is claimed to be education? To set, regulate or modify... Uh, so as to produce a specific response or reaction. And that's what so-called education is doing. It's um, conditioning children to set, regulate or modify so as to produce a specific response or reaction, i.e. see the world the way that suits the state. And then we go on to the definition of prison. Any place of confinement or involuntary restraint. Well, it's confinement because children are told when they have to be there, when they can leave. And it's involuntary restraint because how many kids want to spend virtually their entire formative years in a school being told what to do and what not to do, when to speak and when not to speak, when they can go to the toilet, when they can't. Think about it. This is what's going on. Oh, my, my children go to a good prison now. And the idea um, to extend the school day, which is this theme around the world, certainly uh, in Britain uh, very recently is simply to well to do the two things to extend the time each day when this programming can go on and of course the teachers and ed teachers the vast vast overwhelming majority almost all of them have no idea because they've been through the same system and downloaded the same program they've no idea that they are programmed programmers being used to program the next generation. And of course, one of the things that um, uh, has been announced with this extension of the school day is that all schools in this country are going to become uh, what they call academies, which is just a fancy way of saying we're moving towards the privatisation of education because the idea is for corporations to run everything, including these prisons of the mind. And not only do we have these long, long school days 
we have homework. For many kids, piles of it. So when they leave the prison, the prison gives them more work to do to continue the programming of the prison, even when they're not there. Anyone think about this? Homework? You can't, quote, educate people through most of the day, five days a week, at least for their entire formative years. They have homework as well. It's ridiculous. I think there should be a mass refusal to do homework. Mass refusal. Unless people want to do it, unless the kids say, no, I like homework, I want to do it. Fair enough. You want to do what you want. Otherwise, mass refusal to do it. It's nonsense. And it's nothing to do with education. It's to do with control. And in the USA, particularly, I mean, Texas, I rest my case. Have a look what's going on there. They're, they're imposing the will of the school on more and more um, of the child's time outside of school. And the idea is not to educate, but simply to prepare the um, next generation to be the adult slaves of um, the coming years. And here's a classic. This is a quote from J.D. Rockefeller. Nice man. Very good to his mother. Never went home. Um, and he was the creator of the General Education Board in America in 1903. And of course, J.D. Rockefeller, he cared so much about children and cared so much about people. And this is what he said. I don't want a nation of thinkers I want a nation of workers, a nation of obedient slaves. And you, you, you hear it all the time, don't you? Governments. Um, education should prepare children for the workplace. No, it shouldn't. Education should set free um, all the gifts that children have that... that don't include passing exams. What are exams? They're just tests to see how, how much of the programming you've downloaded. Nothing to do with intelligence. I worked with people in journalism years ago who had first class degrees and all this stuff. Crikey. They could hardly tie their own shoelaces. Remembering facts and intelligence are not the same thing. But we're supposed to believe they are, so we will accept this crap called um, education. Preparing children for the workplace simply means turning children into unthinking, unquestioning, acquiescent cogs to replace the previous generation of cogs in the state machine. And um, this, um, this is uh, going on more and more. You see, what they're doing, this extension of the school day is, of course, obviously part of it, is they are reducing and reducing and reducing the time that children and young people have to free think, to ponder, to let their mind wander where it wants to go, to be creative in its true sense. They don't want people like that. Dangerous. And so they are focused in five sense reality all day often filling their minds full of total crap. Algebra. What's all that about? Well, you've got to get educated, get a job. <clears throat> Mr. Brown, you've, you've come for this, um, this job today. Um, 
First question, um, what does x equal? Anybody ever had that question? Oh, I don't know. Oh, well, Mr. Brown, you're not really what we're looking for. It's all rubbish. But it's filling time and it's filling and blocking potential creativity with this tidal wave of irrelevant crap. Most of it called education so children don't have mind chill time me time and and even when they do now from another angle we have the addiction to smartphones so when do when do when do, when do most children young people now have real pondering chill time when they're not focused on something school homework smartphone um, and if anyone thinks that's a, just a coincidence, they're missing the point completely about what's really going on. And like I say, these, um, these schools are becoming dictatorships. Uh, the producer um, on the uh, Richie Allen radio show uh, was sent a letter, as were all the parents, to this particular school. Um, regarding something called safeguarding. I talked about that in previous um, video cast. Safeguarding children, safeguarding boards that Orwellian term they use. Um, and safeguarding is Orwellian speak for an excuse for more and more control to protect the children. But you know, just round the corner from here, um, my children went to the school there. It had a little wall around it and people walked in and out and took their kids to school and it was not a problem. There was never any problem. There was never any danger. No threat to them. People just got on with it. It's a school. Go in the school, hello, morning, all that stuff. Now you want to see it. It not only um, is part of this prison system it looks like a prison. None of these schools look like prisons. It's got big, a big uh, prison-like fence around it. Uh, you, you go in one part, but then you can't go in the next part without going through another locked gate, just like they do in prisons. And it's a school for little kids. And um, this is um, the, the, the letter. And it's, uh, this is just one thing it said. We now have one additional safety feature to bring into place. You see the excuse, safety, safety. You look at the, the thing about terrorism and then we must take your freedoms away to protect your freedoms from terrorists. It's the same theme in, in these bloody schools. And it says, if children are not in school for 8.55 a.m., not 8.56, outrageous, minute late, if they're not in school for 8.55 a.m., the parent carer bringing them needs to report to the school office to enter a reason in a late report book. Thank you, it says, for helping us all to keep our children safe and strive to ensure children do not miss the important start to the day. Oh, my goodness me. Talk about the program, programming the next generation. And this letter also says, without parents' knowledge, that um, some bloke from the Healthy Eating Audit has been looking into their uh, lunch boxes and now has made a report on, 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 on what's in them. I mean, Pete, the, 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 um, the control and the influence um, is all going to the state from parents. Crazy. I mean, you, th you think about, you think about this sequence. It's called life in childhood. You come out of the womb, and within a, what? This idiot I've just described once once it started two years of age, but it's now, what, three, four, something like that? 
you have a few years with your parents, what, a few years, two or three years with your parents, who, who are also often passing on their programming because they've been through the same sequence you're about to go through. You then um, find yourself at the age of three or four, just coming to the world, and now you're sitting at a desk with an authority figure for all your formative years from now on, telling you what's right and wrong when you have to be there. 8.55, no later. When you can leave, what you must wear, what's right, what's wrong, when you can eat, like I say, when you can go to the toilet. And this is preparing you to become an acquiescent slave throughout your life in terms of acquiescence to authority. And so we're looking at the most blatant programming um, operation for our kids. And this is why they're doing everything they can, not only to extend the school day, but make sure that children don't have any, any chance of not being in that program day after day after day after day. That's why they're fining parents now. They're fining parents if their children are not at school. If they're taken away uh, on holiday because it's cheaper outside school time. They're fining parents. It's outrageous. And parents accept it. They might moan about it, but they accept it. Just as there should be a mass refusal to do homework for those that don't want to do it, there should be a mass refusal to pay these fines en masse. Keep children out of school, those who can, and, and, until it changes even. En masse, it has to be en masse. I mean, years ago, when, when, when my son Jamie was, was just a little boy, I, was on, I went on a speaking tour, a world speaking tour. Oh, and we took him out of school. And we took him to Canada. We took him to Hong Kong. We took him to Australia. We took him to South Africa where he saw um, wildlife parks and, 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 and uh, animals that most people only read about in books um, in, in their, uh, at least up to a point, their natural habitat. And the school was like, Oh, he's, he's going to miss out of being away from school for so. No, he's not. And no, he didn't. Oh, you mean he's going to miss out? So, you know that book with all those pictures of lions and elephants and, and, and what have you? Yeah. So, he's missed out by not reading that because he was actually there seeing them in the flesh. I left school at 15 when you could in those days. I'm old because I went to be um, a footballer and I never took a uh, major exam in my life let alone pass one thank you God and now he's a stream of books uh, which I've been writing um, for the last 25 years and not only did I do that despite Ignoring education, basically. But ignoring education made it easier because I had a, a mind that hadn't been programmed with a certain view of everything. Education, education, education is a myth. I'm all for education. But that's not what we had. And not only that, children are being prepared not only to accept acquiescence to authority and download a certain perception of life, which they then, you know, repel all borders so often in terms of alternatives to the program and their beliefs and their perceptions. Not only that, but they're being prepared to accept an Orwellian state of technological control on a m massive extreme scale this is why they're putting more and more cameras in the schools they're having um, uh, fingerprints to take um, library books out biometrics and all this stuff oh it's to protect the children oh really well what, why wasn't it necessary before just like the 
massive fences around the school around the corner weren't necessary before. Nothing to do with protecting children. It's to do with preparing them to accept that this is how life is. Get the kids to be brought up with, with technological control everywhere, cameras everywhere, and they'll be far less likely to rebel against it when everywhere in the world, in their adult life, is the same. And like I said earlier, this is um, totally connected to the increasing control of children and the stealing of children from loving parents by the state social services. In Scotland now, um, they are introducing um, something called um, a named uh, a guardian, a state guardian. They're actually um, in the process of designating a state named guardian for every child until aged 18 years. Um, overriding, because that's the idea, no matter what they tell you, overriding more um, influence and decision making by parents. And this lady, uh, leader of the Scottish Nationalists, um, Nicola Sturgeon, um, who of course, you know, wants independence for Scotland. I think that's great as well. But she wants to keep in the EU um, and she wants people to vote to stay in the EU in this referendum. And you can't have an independent anywhere that's in the tyranny that is the EU. So that contradiction in terms is, is ridiculous also. But she is um, arguing and has argued um, for these state designated guardians for children, a named person, they call them. And um, this is uh, from uh, one of the, the groups that are, uh, have been opposing it. Um, this is a state official, the named person, um, tasked with looking after a child's well-being, which is, of course, extremely subjective. That is their happiness well, what does that mean? No, no, you, you're not going to be on that smartphone every hour you're awake. Well, that's made me unhappy. I'm going to my guardian. This state guardian will be uh, put in place regardless of whether or not children or parents wish to have one and regardless of whether there is any need for state intervention. Now, think of the Orwellian extremes here that are being sold, as always, with helping and protecting the children because we care so much we're controlling their lives confusingly there are already named person pilot schemes in operation across Scotland but the legislation does not actually come into force until August 2016 um, a government funded leaflet said that um, their duties of the named person um, include having to check if children get a say in how their room is decorated and what they watch on TV. A named person will have the power to speak to a child, including about very personal issues, and provide information or advice, all without requiring parental consent. And so it goes on. It is absolutely outrageous. And if people can't see what that's about and where it's leading... Well, my goodness me, I doubt they can see anything. We're having this situation where our children are being burned out. They're being uh, caused to have um, a, a childhood of stress, trying to meet expectations for these prison programming centres and parents that take their belief in their child's success or failure based on the prison programming centres and this burning out where children actually commit suicide because of the pressure and fear of failure of um, exams is all planned I quote you again 
from the Rockefeller Insider, speaking in 1969. Education. Pressures of the accelerated academic program, the accelerated demands, these pressures um, will cause some students to burn out. Planned to do that. He said, the smartest ones will learn how to cope with pressures and to survive. There will be some help available to students in handling stress, but the unfit won't be able to make it. They will then move on to other things. Um, in this connection, and later on in the connection with drug abuse and alcohol abuse, he indicated that psychiatric services to help would be increased dramatically. We're seeing this. More and more psychiatrists and psychiatric drugs for kids, even at the most ridiculously young ages. In all, the Pushing for Achievement programming on the state's um, say-so it was recognised that many people would need help and the people worth keeping around would be able to accept and benefit from that help and still be super achievers. Those who could not would fall by the wayside and therefore were sort of dispensable, expendable, um, I guess is the word I want. This is what is happening to children Every day, the parents say, see you later, pick you up after school. And it's so, it's so incessant and it's so all pervading that the teachers who are directly um, playing the part of child programmers think they're doing the best for the kids if we don't address this and parents don't get together and address this en masse then what's the next generation of adults going to be like in terms of free thought questioning the states in positions this is a massive, massively important topic and subject which needs to be addressed before it's too late. You know, there's this idea among many people who, even those that accept that there is this cabal, that they basically work through the rich and famous, the establishment. But if they only did that, they wouldn't be controlling all aspects of what they wanted to dictate to achieve the outcome. And what a lot of people uh, don't realise and um, do not appreciate is that if you take the political spectrum, they manipulate those that are of the left, of what have become known as progressives, progressive people, progressive organisations, which is about campaigning for freedom and justice and fairness and what have you. Um, that that um, arena is targeted just as much by this cabal as the establishment. In fact, so much of what has become known as the progressive arena, progressive organisations, have actually been progressive political parties, have become part of the establishment while thinking they're challenging it. And I've spent much of my life, certainly the last uh, more than a quarter of a century, campaigning daily in many and various ways for freedom, protection of freedom, for justice, for fairness, for all the things that these progressive groups of the left uh, would support. But 
if we're not streetwise and if we don't research what's really going on, we don't understand what the game really is, and much of the left and progressives will dismiss any idea of some global conspiracy. If we don't understand that, then we can be played like a stringed instrument by the very forces that we think we are protesting against. And I'm going to um, talk about this, both sides of the Atlantic, um, today. And if the left, the progressives, don't start to understand and take the trouble to find out how the game is played and who's behind the game, then they'll go on being um, manipulated to do what the game wants them to do while they think they're challenging the establishment. First of all, this side of the water in Britain. We're having this EU referendum in June to decide if the British people want to stay in the European Union or come out. Now, as I've been pointing out for decade after decade, the European Union was created from the start to be totalitarian tiptoed step by step into what it's become and what it's meant to become even more so. And that is a centralized fascist communist dictatorship run by dark suit bureaucrats on behalf of the hidden hand. To take away national sovereignty, to break Europe up into regions, to dictate everything from a central point in Brussels, to control the entirety of the European economy and finance, and to become a state in and of itself with what we now call countries subordinate satellites to this power structure. It's bad for everyone except those that are at the core running it and those behind those who appear to be running it. And so it is sickening to my bone marrow to witness the grotesque sight of so-called progressive political parties in this country. The Labour Party, the Scottish National Party, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens all united in their desire to persuade the British people to vote to stay in that little lot, the EU. Now, some of them, key people here and there, mostly in the shadows, will know what the European Union is really about and will be campaigning through these organisations, not just the parties, but others I'll come to in a second, to bring about this outcome of staying in the EU. But the vast majority of people in those parties and these other groups, progressive groups, will be campaigning to stay in the EU because they are completely ignorant of what the EU is about, what it's there to do, what its intentions are, and how it's been orchestrated to be what it is now and what it is designed to become from the day that it was created as a free trade area. As Martin Luther King said, 
There is nothing in the world more dangerous than conscientious ignorance and sincere ignorance. So, we had the leader of the British Labour Party, the opposition uh, party, the main opposition party in the uh, London Parliament, Westminster Parliament, Jeremy Corbyn, who has spent his political career up to this point opposing the European Union and pointing out very correctly uh, what um, what the uh, the organization is really about and this week he made a speech supporting Britain staying in the EU and he now stands alongside all those other so-called progressive parties and the Cameron wing of the Conservative Party. And you would find it very difficult to get those parties to agree on almost anything else. And yet, here they are, all agreed to stay in this grotesque destroyer of freedom and we've seen nothing yet and you'll see also other progressive groups uh, take Friends of the Earth for instance the environmental campaigning group but so many others who support staying in the EU and yet are funded to a fantastic extent collectively by um, the EU. Here we have uh, Friends of the Earth Europe, for instance, that gets massive funding from the European Union. And we're asked to believe that that does not influence its decision to campaign and, and try to get its um, members around the country to campaign to keep Britain in the EU. There are the number of organisations that the European Union funds is unbelievable. And then what happens is when there's a problem and the EU needs support, like now in this referendum, all these organisations come out and say, oh, we ought to stay in the EU, yeah, it's good. Without mentioning that they're all on the payroll. So what ha what's happened is that the EU has funded all these groups, bought them, basically, and then um, it gets the groups it funds to campaign for it to do things with regard to the particular subject area um, involved that mean that the EU takes more power to the centre to deal with these situations that these EU funded groups are demanding that they deal with. It's a complete stitch up wherever you look. We have politicians uh, campaigning to stay in the EU we say oh look at all these groups that, that are supporting staying in what they don't mention is uh, that these groups are funded by the EU therefore they have something to lose if we come out and take our freedom back or some of it we have the BBC that is um, at the centre in the mainstream media in this country, at the centre of this whole um, in-out debate, that takes funding from the EU. Took a Freedom of Information uh, request to 
pull it out of them. How can you be independent of um, the EU in a debate when you're taking funding from it? And, th and then there's this Friends of the Earth um, round um, document that was sent to around to all the, um, the members of Friends of the Earth, um, demanding or asking, encouraging that other other members around the country campaign to stay in the EU. And um, they're saying, if you'd like to send us, uh, we'd like you, you, you to, uh, to have campaigning uh, materials such as leaflets. And if you're organising an event, we'll try to get a speaker there. It's all orchestrated by what should be an environmental group to keep us in the, in the uh, EU. And it says here, Friends of the Earth is proudly party politically impartial. Uh, we tell it like it is. All right. OK, yes. Um, no matter who is in government or opposition. Uh, but it says campaigning for an in vote in June's referendum is completely consistent with Friends of the Earth's commitment to political impartiality. What they're talking about is party political impartiality. What they're campaigning for is a political position, a fundamentally uh, political position to decide what form of government makes the laws in this country. How much more political can you get? And then we have former EU commissioners former Labour Party politicians, for instance, Lord Mandelson and Neil Kinnock, coming out and saying, we must stay in. What they don't tell you is that they are um, subject to rules and regulations to protect their EU pensions. This is a story from the Daily Telegraph. Um, European rules show that if Mandelson, in this case, speaks out against Europe as a former commissioner, he could be stripped of his pension altogether. Documents seen by campaigners show that Lord Mandelson and other commissioners like, like Kinnock um, have to abide by certain obligations, quote, both during and after their term of office. Um, one of these obligations as a staff member of the Commission is to maintain a duty of loyalty to the communities. If they fail to demonstrate loyalty to the EU, Lord Mandelson and these others can, quote, be deprived of his right to a pension or other benefits, the rules say. Did the EU-funded BBC ask the EU-funded Kinnock and Mandelson about this conflict of interest? Not to my knowledge, they didn't. And we've had calls this week for children, um, as a matter of course in schools, to be taught the benefits of being in the European Union. Wherever you look, this organisation is stitching up the game by controlling through funding, not least, all sides. And we're not by funding, by ignorance of what the game is. And then when we go across to the progressive arena in the United States, we find... Um, a similar situation. The Arab Spring, these apparently spontaneous uh, people's revolutions in the Middle East, which have caused devastation in their consequences. And when you do any modicum of research, you see that it was orchestrated from the start to use a people's revolution to target a, a, a regime that the cabal wanted to change. 
and how these revolutionaries, some of them genuine, but again in ignorance of the game, uh, and, and the others, mercenaries, many of them, were funded, armed and trained by the West to go about their business apparently in a spontaneous revolution of the people to target these regimes and people they wanted to remove. Well, one of the key networks that specialises in training people in civil resistance and disobedience is the Open Society Network of a billionaire financier and cabal to his DNA called George Soros. As I speak, there is something going on in Washington, D.C. called Democracy Spring alongside something called Democracy Awakening. And these are people who have been um, invited to training sessions in the art of civil disobedience, etc. And are protesting the vast majority quite genuinely against big business and big money influence in American politics. How many of them, however, know that so many of these organizations in these coalitions that go under these names like Democracy Spring and Democracy Awakening are funded by Soros's Open Society Network? The same network that funded the clearly disastrous and premeditated Arab Spring, as it was called. Um, here is um, what well, is pages and pages and pages of it, and it's a list, one after the other, after the other, after the other, of progressive organisations funded by George Soros. George Soros has no interest whatsoever in human freedom and human rights or any of the stuff that these organisations and, and in most of their uh, members' case genuinely believe in. So why is he funding them? I mean, I'm not just saying, you know, here's 10 quid, here's $50. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars that he puts into these organizations whose, um, with whose members he will, in fact, have nothing in common at all in terms of what he'd like the world to be. There's an organization called Human Rights Watch. There's a progressive organization for you, Human Rights. Quite right. Soros, who wouldn't know a human right if it bit him on the arse, gave Human Rights Watch $100 million. Why? Rewind to the start. How do you dictate the outcome of a game before the game starts? You control, direct, manipulate all sides. And those of us, and, and I share so much in terms of what I would like to happen, with the genuine people in these progressive groups, But what needs to happen if it's going to be effective is 
people need to get informed and they need to get streetwise about how the world's manipulated, to what end, and see the personalities like Soros that just pop up everywhere. Why, why are we having a situation where Democracy Spring is demanding that big money and billionaires uh, get out of buying politics and buying influence when they are connected so fundamentally to billionaire George Soros, who has made an art form out of buying political influence. He supported Obama. That, that worked, didn't it? In terms of changing anything. And he's supporting Hillary Clinton. And someone else is supporting Hillary Clinton. A man called Robert Kagan, co-founder of something called the Project for the New American Century, known as the neocons in America, who were behind the Bush administration at the time of 9-11. I've gone into all that elsewhere. Kagan and these neocons are as anti-progressive as you could possibly imagine. But they're supporting Clinton. And Soros, who's funding all these progressive groups, oh, he's progressive, old George, is supporting Clinton. And Clinton is the person they want for the next president to front up these people in the background, like Soros, to carry out their agenda when in office. And how many of these progressive groups are supporting Clinton also when she is, well, I would call her evil, except that evil would probably sue for defamation of character. It's sickening to observe it all. All these people who are campaigning for um, action on climate change, which are just the uh, changes in society that this cabal wants. There's Friends of the Earth campaigning for action by the EU on climate change, which the EU wants to take because it's, it's part of the same agenda, while being funded by the EU. And unless, like I say, people who are genuinely in pursuit of a fairer, more just and freer world. Unless they get um, informed and get out of their box, stop getting their information from the mainstream media and go and find it elsewhere, because it exists in, in great amounts, if only people would look. Unless they do that, they're going to go on thinking they're making a difference thinking they are um, protesting against the, the system, the state, the establishment, while the establishment and the cabal are doing that. This whole progressive arena needs to get informed and needs to grow up much of it. before we get much further down the road and they realise how much they've been taken and how much they played a part in what by then will be happening. That is the last thing they want to happen. Get informed and then people can make informed decisions on what they support and what they don't, by knowing what the game is, what the techniques of manipulation are, and what the personalities like Soros are, in terms of their real agenda.
it's very sensible to look at other things that are predicted and outlined in that book, 1984. And one is something called Newspeak. Orwell's Newspeak was to so change and transform the language that the words no longer existed to say anything in detail. The words no longer existed to criticise authority. And of course, as Orwell pointed out, when you destroy the language, when you destroy words so that you cannot speak in a way that expresses your thoughts, then as the generations pass, that also stops you even thinking in detail. Because on one level, when we think, we think in words. If those words don't exist to express your own thoughts, now you can't even think in detail. Never mind, express yourself in detail. And so, as with Big Brother, as with the never-ending war, as with the um, telescreens, so we have Newspeak, and it's called Political Correctness. And if you align that with text speak, you can see how the language is changing, you can see how words are being destroyed, you can see how the right to say certain words and phrases of words is being destroyed. And it is, just like Big Brother, just like the telescreens, just like the never-ending war, it is systematically engineered to be like that. The, the road to current day political correctness brackets insanity and madness is not only not over yet because they've not completed the job but it actually started a long time ago. I've shown in my books how social engineering fronts like the Frankfurt School going back to the first part of the 20th century, had political correctness and the Orwellian newspeak words uh, destru destruction in their sites all those decades ago. And uh, what we're seeing now is an explosion of political correctness and imposed newspeak in colleges and universities, well, in society in general, but certainly in colleges and universities across the world, not least in North America and Britain. And the sad thing is, and the chilling thing is, that this is not being directly imposed upon people by the authorities but by students upon students. So where once universities were places of radical thought and radical campaigning now they are places where people are prepared for the adult world that's coming of newspeak and political correctness even compared with now on steroids. And the people who have bought this political correctness scam, this social engineering, are so childlike 
so naive, so arrogant and up their own ass that they cannot see as they go about their business of condemnation and character assassination and onslaughts of abuse against people who have allegedly broken the code of political correctness. They cannot see when they're doing that that they're just tools of the very state that many of them claim to oppose. We um, have more and more labels that make people perceive themselves in smaller and smaller ways. We are infinite awareness having an experience as what we call a human. And if you perceive yourself only to be human and not consciousness having an experience as a human, you've already diminished yourself in terms of um, self-identity. But what's happening now, absolutely systematically, is the human is being subdivided into endless categories, all of which have to be defended uh, by political correctness from any criticism or any comment that could possibly upset people. And this whole, this whole arena that's so fast emerging of what people call safe space and um, the right not to be upset is all part of this destruction of A, the language, and B, freedom of expression. You cannot say anything that won't upset someone. So once you have this situation where you can't say anything that might upset anyone, you're closing in on the situation where you can't say anything. And this is what's happening. But these idiots, these thought police that um, police the language and police opinion on the basis of what they find acceptable, the arrogance of it, the tyranny of it. These people, some will know, most of them are so stupid, so clueless, so self-absorbed that they won't see that they're just pawns in a game that they don't understand. So we have a situation where you say something quite mild and you're racist. You say something quite mild and you are homophobic or you're transgender phobic or whatever the latest bloody politically correct label is. And you get a situation where we've got this, this boxer, um, Tyson Fury, just won the world championship. And he's come out with, um, from my perspective, ludicrous statements about the role of women, ludicrous statements about gays, etc., um, etc. But he's a boxer, you know, he, he's a sportsman. He's not a politician changing the law. And what anyone with any kind of balance and perspective would say when someone said to them, um, have you seen what that Tyson Fury said? He said this about women. He said this about gays. And you go, idiot. What are we going to do this weekend? You get on with your life. Just an idiot who has a right to be an idiot, by the way. It's called freedom. But we mustn't upset anybody. In other words, we mustn't say anything worth hearing, whether it's nonsense by Tyson Fury or whether it's serious stuff that needs to be heard 
that it's exposing the global tyranny. It's all part of this silencing of anything beyond the myopic norm that's acceptable to the state. And we have this political correct insanity that's reached the stage now where some of its high profile advocates are saying this everything is racist everything is homophobic and you have to point this all out but if you point out that that is blatant fricking nonsense then you're being politically incorrect do you know there's a, a fella in um, in Canada who's now facing a possible jail sentence for challenging the views of some feminists on um, on social media this is where it's going and it's this is this is the point this whole thing about feminism and, and, and homophobia and, and all this stuff the people actually behind political correctness couldn't give a damn about women that's the force that's been suppressing women all these years and decades and centuries they could care less about uh, gay people and their rights could care less about any of this stuff that political correctness is supposed to be about because that's not what it's really about it's about using these things to push humanity along the road to newspeak and the end of any opinion that does not suit the state. The other thing about political correctness and its um, tyrannical advocates and imposers is that they can say what the hell they like and it can't be politically incorrect this is how it works you take a minority whatever it may be and the minorities change all around the world of course who's the minority majority and the minority then looks for a majority that's suppressing it and so the majority whatever the majority is in whatever situation cannot be politically um, correct um, against the minority and the minority cannot be politically incorrect against the majority and um, this was um, highlighted in a single quote there's a lady who was the um, student diversity officer at um, goldsmiths uh, part of the University of London I think her name was uh, Baha Mustafa now this lady um, hit the headlines by as a diversity officer um, trying to ban men and white people from a meeting about equality and diversity I kid you not and when challenged on this inversion um, she said, I can't be racist or sexist because I am an ethnic minority woman. This is the self-delusion that we're dealing with. That it's not about fairness, justice, equality. I'm all for that. Equality, justice, fairness for white males, for um, minority uh, women for gays all of them why should we not have fairness justice and equality for all but that's not th what this is about and that quote is a classic they don't want equality they want tyranny where whatever the minority is in a certain situation they have control over the majority they'll never see that because they're stupid but that's what's happening and let's, let's get across this myth that majorities always impose themselves on minorities it's not true 
You look at through history and you'll see how many times minorities have imposed themselves on majorities, whatever the minority of majority was. Look at apartheid South Africa. Small white minority imposed its will on the black majority for decades and decades and decades. But political correctness cannot survive unless it sees the world completely, symbolically and literally, in terms of black and white. And one of the other major concepts of Orwell in 1984, I mentioned it already, was what I call the inversion. He talked about um, um, war is peace um, and uh, Freedom is slavery and ignorance is strength. Well, in terms of political correctness, it talks about, and its childlike um, advocates talk about, diversity. That lady called a diversity officer. But what they're actually doing is destroying diversity in the name of diversity. What diversity can you have when you have a gathering campaign to silence anything that challenges the politically correct norm? What's that got to do with diversity? It's destroying it. Of course it is. It's what it's meant to do. And then you talk about um, tolerance. Well, they talk about tolerance. And if there are more intolerant people on planet Earth than the politically correctness extremists, well, I have met them. Anything you say that's slightly out of order and they're on the Internet, they're on the media, screaming abuse and outrage. Here's a, a, a great quote that, that sums up political correctness and it's inverted diversity by a guy called Jacques Buzzle, uh, a French-born American historian and he described it like this political correctness does not legislate tolerance it organizes hatred and so you have people who are talking about hate speech and uh, condemning um, people for upsetting someone or other and they do it with absolute hatred and intolerance. They're being played like a stringed instrument and they can't see it. And this whole um, labeling people has been going on for a while. It's just expanding. I mean, you know, all the way since the creation of Israel. If you um, challenge Israel, you're anti-Semitic. It actually doesn't mean anti-Jewish, fully enough, if you look deeply into the real meaning of what anti-Semitic means, but that's another story. It doesn't mean you're anti-Jewish to challenge Israel. It means you're anti-Palestinians being bombed from the air to death and destruction. And what goes on in the occupied territories in Israel in general in regard to Palestinians. But challenge that, challenge that. And you are a racist, you are politically incorrect. And that's what is now being expanded across the whole spectrum of society. Ways to silence genuine dissent and justified criticism through this politically correct nonsense and it's also about divide and rule if we came from the concept that we are all one consciousness having different experiences then that um, from its very foundation is based on unity. Diversity of expression 
of one infinite awareness. The more labels you invent, the more potential there is for playing those labels off against each other. And that's what is happening. And so the different labels who self-identify with um, their sexuality, their, their race, their whatever, their religion, the different labels often don't get upset by what people say and the opinions people have. There's so many things in, in relation to what's called Islamophobia and politically correct condemnation and calling it Islamophobia. When most people from the Muslim perspective are going, okay, that's mate, what's the problem? But political correctness makes it a problem. And part of that is telling these different labels that they should be upset. They have to be upset because um, political correctness needs upset people. Otherwise it can't function. And so what you're doing is you're removing the concept of this. For those um, extreme advocates of political correctness, this is called a backbone. And we all have one. It's just that some political correct advocates and those who believe the bollocks have forgotten. And political correctness doesn't want you to have one of these. It wants you to be like a jelly that's upset by anything. We, we had a situation in, in, in an American university recently where... Um, uh, students were offered counselling for seeing a sticker of a confederate flag on someone's laptop. This is where we're going. And what does the state want to control the population? Let's get down to bloody basics here. It wants childlike people who are easily upset and want the state to protect them from whatever the latest manufactured upset may be. Now there is racism. There is homophobia. There is um, uh, a bias and prejudice, a prejudice against people of different types, including prejudice by some politically correct groups against white males. But this is not about that. This is about manufacturing apparent prejudice. 